Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through various RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through a review copy that I was sent of the adventurous fantasy role-playing game by Sebastian Gravney over at Dawn Fist Games. This is such a fantastic game. Um, it's I had never heard of it before Sebastian contacted me and asked if I would go through it, and I'm really happy that he did because it is a great introduction to role-playing games for people who have never really gotten into them at all. That's sort of how he builds it, is sort of like a, um, hey, this is for players who have never played a role-playing game before but who are interested in getting into it. Very simple, very straightforward. But I think it's almost more of like a, I'm not even sure how I would put it, it's a compilation of a bunch of really cool rules from a bunch of different games, different styles of games. And the, the compilation, this particular compilation, works really, really well together. But the basic mechanic is, in fact, quite simple. Very straightforward, and it is, I would say it's simple in a way that is, it's simple for new players, not just simple for long-time players. Like, there's a difference. <laughs> I think a lot of us, especially if we've been in the hobby for years, we tend to think of certain rules or ideas as simple. But really what we mean by that is, it's like, once you understand it, it's not complex. But I think sometimes to get to that point, it doesn't, doesn't use natural language, it doesn't make easy sense, whereas this book, does use natural language. It is very straightforward. It's very easy to understand. And it takes a lot of the, I would say, the, the simplest to understand rules from a bunch of different games and plugs them in. Now, that's not to say that it's the simplest game you're ever going to run into. In fact, I think that there are simpler games out there. The basic mechanic of this game is a D6, and I think there are simpler D6 systems, like Phi I Say, for example, is a, which I've reviewed before, is a simpler D6 system. But this one has a level of complexity which should appeal to players after a a bit longer of a campaign than I think Fi I Save would, which is just, a, you know, pretty quick. And you're, uh, you've kind of gotten through everything that there is to get through in that game in terms of mechanics or, or expanding your character. This has certainly more mechanical flair built into it as you level up. So this PDF is 185 pages, and it goes through all the basic rules that you'll need to play the game. So as I said, now one thing, one thing about this game before I go further is the art. It's one area that I find it... It works and it's consistent and it's totally consistent. The art throughout the whole thing gives the same vibe. But really what it is is it's, you know, free pictures that have been taken online and modified so that they can be used in a, you know, a paid product. And so a lot of the pictures are just pictures of people. And so really I think the vibe that this gives me is almost more like LARPing than role-playing. Now it obviously is role-playing, tabletop role-playing, but just because of those pictures, I, I, I'm brought to mind like really, you know, like movies and uh, or YouTube series with high production value about LARPers or about fantasy games. It, it honestly brings to mind things like, um, like The Gamers, if you guys have ever seen that movie. So what is the premise of the game? What, are the, what world <laughs> is Adventurous played in? The items you need to play and do you need a board? Now what you'll see is that this is, it's kind of built for new players, but it's also built for new GMs. So this is kind of designed for brand new everybody. Here's the core mechanic, D6s. So you have attributes, which are standard D&D attributes, close to standard D&D attributes, there's no constitution score, but the others are basically the same. And you have a value of one to six in each, or one to five in each, I should say. And that's the number of dice that you roll. So again, it's very straightforward. If a new player sat down and says, what do these numbers mean? I have, a, I have strength of three. What does that mean? Oh, that means you roll three six-sided dice. Very simple, right? Just very clear, easy to understand. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get fives and sixes, which is a, you know, a usual mechanic we've seen in some of these D6 systems. A five and a six. If, you, if after the result of all of your rolls, you have one, five, or six, you have a weak success. If you have two or more, it's a strong success. If you don't have any fives and sixes, it's a failure. And that's it. That's the whole system. Now, when weapons, uh, this, this works into the whole game. So, for example, weapons have a weak damage and a strong damage that they deal. So if you get a weak success, you do the weak damage. If you get a strong success, you do the strong damage. Um, and then there's this W3S6. What does that mean? And double sixes. Double sixes are a special success. It gives you something called momentum. Now, another thing that this uh, system tells you is that when you get a failure on a roll, you get a point of experience. And when you get double sixes, you get a point of experience. Um, here's momentum. Essentially, momentum you can use to re-roll dice, or you can use it to activate certain magic items. And again, you either have it or you don't. It's a cool idea. And it lasts until the party rests to any degree. Five minute break or for the night. Stopping breaks the flow and thus breaks momentum. So you really want to use it. 
I just wish the language was a little clearer here. It says the player's pool of momentum. So it sounds like it was sort of intended to be a momentum pool that could build up. And then a, there was a decision made to just make it either binary. I think that language should be cleared up. The language of a pool makes it sound like you get multiple dice, uh, multiple momentum points. So I would clear up that language. But otherwise, I think the system is really cool. You have it or you don't. There are five attributes, strength, dex, will, knowledge, and charisma. Now here's what I meant about the art, right? It's just clearly pictures of people who are, you know, dressed up and then it's been put through a filter and then presented here. So you might not like that. You might, I think that if this book were to get a lot of success and uh, it were to sell well, I would probably go in for a second edition at some point with, you know, drawn art or, or different art that isn't just, you know, in the, in the public domain, so to speak. But, but I think it works per totally well. And as I said, it's consistent throughout. So it definitely gives you a tone. Now, name, age, gender, and race are all uh, non-mechanical. The only thing that really matters here are your attributes and your class and your equipment. The influences here are very clearly Lord of the Rings, World of Warcraft, uh, Game of Thrones. Just it draws from a lot of fantasy because it's not trying to be, I think, very, very hyper-specific in its tone. It's trying to be vanilla. It's trying to be, I won't say generic, but it's trying to be, you know, like, first step. Here is what fantasy RPGs are like for new people, right? It's trying to be like that. And so it gives you this sort of broad spectrum. But there's also, by the way, at least three quotations from Darkest Dungeon in here, which I always approve of. Um, you have your classes, which have primary attributes and then class features. You get abilities, talents, uh, and basically talents are ways of specializing your character. Every few levels you get one talent and you can max out at three. And there are six options presented. So you can kind of you know, specialize your character a bit. Now, one thing that this game does is it takes sort of the fourth edition D&D idea of at-will powers and counter powers and daily powers. And I know a lot of people don't like that system, but it is really, really straightforward and it makes sense to new players. And again, this is where I think we need to distinguish between what makes sense to us after having played the game for a long time and, and what new people getting into the hobby might expect. Having this idea that, yeah, you can use this anytime you want, or yeah, you can use this, but it's only once per encounter. And it says roughly 10 minutes to recuperate, which is good. I'm glad that it says that because I think there could be confusion otherwise about what an encounter means. You might say, oh, okay, so, you know, is that every time I talk to the guy, I can, I can use it again? Or if I leave the room and come back, is that a new encounter? No, it's clear. It's roughly every 10 minutes to recuperate. So you can't spam it that way. And then daily, at least six hours of sleep in order to get it back. This means it can really only be used once per day. So clear, uh, but general definitions of what these things are. And that's good. Okay, and here are the classes. You have warriors, with a brief description of them and their primary attribute, along with their class features. They all get this. And then you have abilities, which you have at will, uh, encounter, and daily. And they each just, you just get one of each. You have your, your at will power, you have your charge power, or your daily, <laughs> sorry, your encounter power, which in this case is called charge, and your daily power, which is rage. So warriors are more like barbarians in this one. And then you get talents, and as you level up, you're going to get to pick one, two, and then three of these. And that's it. That's the whole class is on two pages. And the first page is really just kind of a description of it. You have your rogue, same idea, dexterity, and then class features, tricks of the trade with sinister strike, smoke bomb as your encounter and vanish as your daily power. And then your talents, again, you just get three. It's very straightforward. Wizards. Now what's interesting is that wizard gets an at will fireball, which is pretty cool. It's not, it's more like fire bolt or something like that, but you can choose. You can either do one target with more damage or all creatures close to a target location for a little bit less damage. Then you get Spectral Hand and Mind Control, and then you get some talents like Levitation or Free Mind or Illusion, Counter Spell, for example. The Paladins, again, the same thing. Hunters, Clerics, Warlocks, Druids. Those are all of the classes. That's it. This is, how you, uh, this is how you create your character. You start with ones and everything, and you get five additional points at level one to spend. And then as you level up at certain points, you can add an additional point or two, depending on what level you've just gained. And that's it. That's basically all advancement as well. And that's the only way your, your attributes change. Now remember, your attributes are tied directly to the number of dice that you roll. So it, it's a very straightforward system. Again, you don't get a ton of craziness. There isn't a ton of builds here, but there's enough flexibility in the talent systems that your warrior is going to be different than the other warrior. And, and you know, your, your starting attribute allocation will also be different. You get starting equipment. It says you can start with this package and anyone can pick it. See, even if you're a warrior, you can start with the scholar package as far as I can tell, although it says what it would be more suitable for. And then you get 25 coins and the whole money system is just coins. Simple and straightforward. 
When you fail a test or get, when you roll double ones, you get one experience point. And then there is a table uh, on the next page for how many experience points you need to level up. And it's very straightforward. Low level, low amounts of experience necessary. So you're probably going to be leveling up fairly quickly because you're probably going to fail, I don't know, not necessarily all the time, but fairly often. One thing that makes sense is that you actually have to have real stakes for a test. So players can't just spam something that they're bad at, right? <laughs> Jumping across a puddle of water so that they can level up. You have to actually have, you know... Um, stakes for the test that you're trying to do. And failed initiative tests don't reward experience. And here's what you need level to get to level two. Three experience points, you get an attribute and a talent. Level three, eight experience points, uh, attribute and talent. Four, 16, attribute and talent. And five, 25 experience, you get two attributes. And that's it, that's that's the entire loop. Level up to level five and you're done with, with, with progression. And you could obviously go higher than that if you wanted, but that's it. So aside from being a little more flexible because you know any talent can be chosen so there's not like a rank order of talents that get better and better your attributes do get better they're only going to get better by five you don't get more hit points it's a very simple system in that regard some players especially brand new players it's great as an introduction combat is just what you would expect you can act and move it uses zones uh reach and range if you can target multiple creatures and then attacking defending so it, players do everything players roll to attack and if they have a strong success, they do the max. If they do a weak success, they do the weaker. If they fail, they miss. No effect. And then they get attacked. And they make, again, it's strength, dex, and will, depending on what kind of attack it is. Same with melee, same with attacking, same with defending. So you roll your strength to attack in melee and to defend in melee. Use your dex to attack with ranged and defend with range. Will to attack with range, uh, melee. Magic and to defend with magic. Um, and for defense, if you get a strong success, you avoid all damage. If you have a weak success, you take the weak damage of the opponent's attack. And if you fail completely, you take the strong damage of the opponent's effect. So it's a very, it's, I think it's an elegant system. Makes sense that the, the, the weak, strong idea is really good. Now, what this means, by the way, is that if you ever have to roll one die to, to make a test, you cannot have a strong success. You can only ever have a failure or a weak success. So that's worth keeping in mind for players. Massive damage, you can basically do these stunts. And if you succeed, you crit. And if you succeed, you can do double damage, double the weak or double the strong, depending on the outcome of the test. That's a cool idea. And it's risk versus reward. That's thing you're encouraged to make it so that if they succeed on it, it's really good. If they fail, it's really bad. Cover and different conditions. Stuck, frightened, vulnerable, slowed, paralyzed, ongoing damage, fallen, and grappling. And it's all very straightforward. For example, fire, poison, acid, it all does ongoing damage. And it's just a simple, it's just a simple effect. You take one hit point of damage per round for three rounds. And it can restart, but it can't stack. So that's what I mean, like very easy ways of doing it. Now, there are some rules here that are definitely not necessarily easy, like armor durability, or I would say simple in the way that we often think about it, like durability. Most of the time, durability is not something that you're, you're really thinking about in an RPG. I think a lot of games don't do durability. This one does. So you could leave it out if you wanted to be very simple, but it's a really straightforward durability system, and I think it's cool. I would probably, if I'm going to run this system, I would probably use it. But just keep in mind, it's what I mean when I said earlier that it's not necessarily just like the simplest system you're going to run into. But the, it, it, it takes the simplest form of the different rules that it presents, I think, and presents it all together. Um, the uh, NPC reaction table is a simple D6 table instead of a 2D6 table. The morale is the same thing, D6 instead of 2D6. Uh, critical injuries. Now, one thing this game is, is for, <laughs> it seems incredibly lethal. Incredibly lethal. When you're reduced to zero hit points, you become wounded and you immediately roll on the critical injuries table. If you roll one or two, you just die. You have a 33% chance of just straight up dying right away. Now, if you don't die straight up, you have, uh, you're, either, you're, you're gonna be bleeding out and you can either be just unconscious for an hour or just knocked down and bleeding out. And uh, on every turn that you're bleeding out, you roll a five or a six, you roll and on a five or a six, you survive. On a one through four, you die immediately. So you have a one in three chance of dying that first like in instantly. And then every round you have a, a two in three chance of dying. And then you have to do a knowledge test and spend a supply to bandage them up, or you can magically heal them. And if they're wounded, they have disadvantage on all tests until they recover through a proper rest, so a full long night's rest. You can't just do a short rest to heal, heal, heal from being wounded. So this is, this is real rough. If you're introducing a group of people to the OSR, and you want that style of deadly game, this would be a great one to do. You have to rest. And now, you'll, you'll notice that I mentioned that idea of supply, and that's something that this game does use. It uses sort of the, um, what do you call that? Quantum 
inventory idea. Not really quantum inventory. It draws from five torches deep, or maybe maybe it and five torches deep draw from the same place. But it's this idea that we have nebulous supply, and it takes up a certain amount of space and costs a certain amount of money. And then later on, you can use that supply for specific things as the need arises. That you don't have to prepare exactly what you brought. You can just say, oh yeah, I'm going to use supply to say that I brought rations, or to say that I brought you know, materials to repair my armor, or that I brought bandages. Some people really like that. Some people don't, but I think the fact is we mostly, most of us, except for very high simulationist tables, do this anyway, or at least we allow this in edge cases anyway, right? A PC will say to us, well, I know I didn't technically buy bandages, but I have the money and the inventory. Can I say I bought them when I was in town? And most of us say, yeah, that's fine, right? Unless it's like, even if it's critical, I think I've done that before. Like, okay, sure, yeah, you have that. So this is just building that in right away. That's what that sort of supply stuff does. And you have equipment and services and how the damages work. You just have unarmed, one-handed weapons, two-handed weapons, pole arms, and then bows, crossbows, and throwing weapons. That's it for your weapons. Armor and shield, no armor, light armor, heavy armor, and shields. Uh, then you have other gear and supplies and how many coins they cost, right? Straightforward there. Now, most of the time you're going to be buying supplies, um, which... A lot of this, yeah here's, the, yeah, here's the definition of supplies, what you can count as supplies. Now, one of the things it says is that, for example, a lock pick can, be, can, count, can count as supplies, and bandages can count as supplies, but a long pole, climbing gear, or a crowbar can't. So like an armor repair kit counts as supplies, but a climbing gear doesn't? I'm not sure why. Magic items and potions, and this has an amazing, really, I mean, there's a lot of really cool magic items, by the way, but this has, a, a, and cursed items, of course, it has a really great potion alchemy system. I love it. Essentially, you gather ingredients, and then brewing potions, you make a knowledge test, and it costs the ingredients that you have, and if you have a fail effect or a success effect. That's it. So even if you fail, the, the, the brewing of the potion is not useless. I like that. Uh, you don't just waste all of your time and, and effort. Random treasure tables, which, you know, common treasure and kind of different kinds of treasure, which is great. Rare treasure. Awesome tables you throw right into your game. Social interactions and hirelings and how that works. You have a certain number of hirelings limit based on your charisma. And then the, the available hirelings, and they're divided into inexperienced and veteran with costs and equipment changes and attribute changes. That's cool. You can always figure out. And, and it's generic, so defender, woodsman, treasure hunter. It's not specific there. Dungeons and how that works. Now, this game also has a really brilliant system for encounters. It's really cool. So essentially, every time... The players, um, just every round of exploration, which is about 10 minutes, you can do a dungeon move. And then for every round of exploration in the dungeon, the DM rolls a, adds a, a, a puts a, basically a D6 in the center of the table. And for every 10 minutes or so, you add another one and you roll them. Or you roll them whenever the PCs are reckless. Or at the end of that hour, once you have six dice build up, built up there. And for every one or two that you roll, something happens. It's a, it's a really elegant system, and everyone can see you put these sixes out in the table. And if they make noise or they do something reckless, then you roll them before the hour. And if not, once that hour is up, once six rounds have passed, you roll it. And you take. And then once it's rolled, you, take the, you empty the pool and start again. And here's the effects, right? If you have one, one or two, you take stress. Two ones or twos, danger is approaching. Three ones or twos, immediate encounter, and four or more, a big setback. Such an elegant system. I love that. I might just start doing this in my games, period. Like, I, I like this better, I think, than the underclock die. It builds up. You're going to have something bad happen to you at the end of every hour, period. And you might have something happen if the players decide to risk it, if they do something risky. It's, it's such an elegant system. Really cool. Travel, and there's a similar mechanic for traveling. Depending on how far you go, you're going to be adding the sixes into the uh, pool. Nothing happens, a safe journey. Hazards, encounters, or first a hazard, then an encounter, and they happen on the same day. And the hazards affect you after you arrive at your destination, or they have some bad effect. So that's one problem with overland random encounters, right? Is that they have to be, this, there's this idea that they have to be lethal. Or they have to be deadly, because they have to be, there has to be a purpose to them. Especially if you're playing a more narrative game, where you're going from here to there, instead of just hex crawling. If you're going from here to there and you're going to do random encounters, it's like, well, if it's just an easy random encounter, what's the point? So it's got to have some negative effect. So to have a hazard which actually has lasting impact for after you arrive at your destination, that's cool. For example, 
uh, if you roll a 1 on the hazard, you get, when traversing a ravine, the scout trips and falls, taking 4 damage, ignores armor, and injuring a leg, gaining disadvantage on all dex tests, lasting until the second day after arriving at the destination. And then you have a series of encounters, and again, they can be deadly. They can be important, but they're also really cool. They're, they're fun, as written. Okay, you get a great bestiary. With uh, a few things here, monsters always do random attacks. So they have a table for random attacks, and monsters include non, you know, humans, elves, and dwarves, and things like dragons, and, and you get just a, a, a whole bunch of them. And fantastical creatures like trolls and wyverns, wyverns, dragons, and worms. And then you get a very short setting here, very, very short heading, setting. Each hex is 25 miles, so it's a quite big map. Uh, a brief overview with a very small description of each of them. Um, and a table for rumors, or many tables, I should say, of rumors for the Westlands. And here it is. Each of these is 25 miles, so it's a quite, quite big map. Now here, at the end, is advice from the Game Master. And you guys know how I feel about advice, general advice. I mean, I've said it enough, right? I don't tend to like sort of general advice to, to Game Masters in books like this, because most of the time, Game Masters, especially if you're getting an obscure game, or a more obscure game, a smaller game, they're, they've been DMs for a long time. They've been GMs for a long time. You're not a brand newbie. But this game explicitly markets itself to new players, and I think by extension to new DMs. And I think, therefore, the advice is... I'll give it a... I won't say I give it a pass. I, I, I give it a thumbs up. Because I think that given that the explicit purpose here is like, hey, you're new. And I th I, I'll say this. The advice given in this book is better than the advice given in the D&D 5e player, DM's Guide to DMs. It's clearer. It's more straightforward. It's more practical. It's all right there. Um, and so that's another reason why I will give this a pass in terms of my general uh, preference for not having generic advice in books. It's really good advice. How to build a great adventure. The hook, the fork, obstacles, threats, resolution. Practical, straightforward steps in order to make these things happen. And an example of a haunted mine, which is also good because, again, if you're a new DM, maybe you want to actually just use the example there. Describing the world in threes. Great example. Designing good traps. Make them obvious. Probably the best piece of advice that any DM could ever hear if you're going to add, if you're going to include traps. Make it obvious. No one really likes the haha you died kind of trap. How to make interesting NPCs. Three simple straight steps. Goal, fear, and quirk. And here's a list of goals, fears, and quirks. And that's it. You have an index at the end, which is also awesome. Oh, and I forgot to mention that the game has uh, hyperlinks, not here, but in the, in the, um, introduction in the in the table of contents at the end, there are hyperlinks to the major chapter set, section, so you can click on that really easily. And then you have cheat sheets at the end. You can print these off and put them in a screen along with a character sheet. And then the map given for the setting. And a big thank you. <laughs> this is such a good compilation of a bunch of different rules that are are intended to be easy for newcomers. Yeah, put into one place. And I think that's great. Because we all have our homebrew games. We all have our home, home rules and our own way that it works. Even if we're playing OSE or even if we're playing Shadow Dark, we change things. So every single DM does it differently. This is Sebastian's set of rules for new players. And I think they're great. And again, it's very intuitive. You see the number, that's how many dice you roll. That's the base mechanic. I'm trying to get fives and sixes. Awesome. Very clear. The idea of, okay, I'm going to develop a, modif a score and then do a modifier based on that, and then I'm going to roll a 20-sided die, and I you have to roll a number, uh, and you're going to add to it, and then sometimes the number you have to roll changes depending on what the enemy is or doing, and like, it actually adds up in its complexity, especially for brand new people. And I'll tell you, I've, I've played with new players who continually ask, what do I roll? What do I roll? For like 10 sessions, right? Uh, okay, which, which one do I pick up again? Which one is the... Uh, which is the, okay, and like, none of that for this. Now, I'm really quickly going to go through some of these uh, extra adventures because I think that they're worth checking out. Um, the first two are really, really small. They're just really three pages. In fact, maybe I'll go through one of the light, one of these sort of uh, lightweight campaign settings, which is just three pages, and then I'll go through one of the bigger, of the, uh, the bigger campaign settings. And this is what you get, an overview with locations, how to use the, the, this book, <laughs> Uh, themes, set pieces, faction control, and sounds and smells for each of the locations, along with travel events between them. A page for the factions. That's it. So really, I mean, cover page aside, you get two pages for this. The, the name of the faction, description of the faction, and their goal. Key NPCs, rumors and lore, escalation events, uh, if the players do nothing, or just as time goes by, what happens, how do things change. And some NPC generators and magic items. That's it. That's it's it's like the simplest, straightforward 
Um, boom, here's the setting, go play in it. I've ever seen. Now the other one that I wanted to cover here is the Crimson Monastery, which is one of these, um, it's a little longer, this one's 30 pages, 31 pages, not counting, or 30, 30 pages, not counting the cover. Um, and this is a system neutral adventure, but it's bigger, right? So you're gonna get similar ideas. It's also gonna just have that, uh, uh, you know, it has the same kind of like art and presentation. The maps look really good. I think they're probably made on Incarnate, but I'm not sure. So if you're using Adventurous as a game, then this fits right in because all the monsters are already in there, the magic items are already in there, it's all set. But you could easily come up with your own. So there's a what's going on in this region, as well as how to start the adventure with timed events, and what's going on if they haven't engaged with things. Rumors, and then the map of the Shaded Valley, along with the locations that are major there. The Crimson Monastery, the, uh, a wyvern attack or wyvern attack, Grags at Guarding Post, uh, the wyvern lair, the Flooded Tomb and Waste Outlet, some rumors in the valley, and then the quest, starting the adventure, etc. You go through, you get the village, and this one has a more, you know, a, a more detailed breakdown of the town. The blacksmith general store, the goat farm, dusky brew inn, and rumors and, and hooks there. Key people of the town. Uh, the Crimson Monastery, and what's going on there. The waste outlet, and what's there. And then a map of the cathedral, which is one of the uh, locations that you can go into in the Crimson Monastery. And the armory, definite inspiration from World of Warcraft here, right? And then there's a wyvern attack and a potential thing, Greg's trading post. Whenever I think of a, a merchant named Greg or Greg, I think of uh, Viva the Dirtly, Greg the Garlic Farmer uh, from Epic NPC Man. And then the wyvern lair as well. Flooded tomb. Again, just everything you'd need to run a regional adventure for any game, but especially for this one. A bestiary with this monsters from this particular setting. This particular, and the NPCs in their stat box as well as the big bad. And then magical and mysterious items you can find here with random treasure and a thank you. Super straightforward, a great region. And the other one, the last one, by the way, is the Serpent Cult, which is similar. This one's only 15 pages, so it's more similar to the second. It's a little smaller and shorter in terms of its content. So this is Adventurous by Don Fist Games and the supplements that are out for it right now. I highly recommend it. It is fantastic, lightweight, and the idea of that D6 system is, in my, in my, from my point of view, elegant. I love D6 systems. It gives new players kind of what they might expect from an epic fantasy game without bogging everybody down. So highly recommend checking out the Adventurous system. All right, guys, I hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you all in another video.